the Panikos Dimitriades from the University of Leicester. So he has a vast experience in central banking uh, from 2012 to 2014. He served as governor of Central Bank of Cyprus. And last year, he published a book, Central Bank Independence and the Future of the Euro, uh, in which he discussed a lot of issues uh, and topics that are relevant for today's conference. So please, Panikos, the floor is yours. Um, so good morning, everyone. So it's actually quite nice that Martin talked first in some sense because he, he gave some uh, the background theory to independence, which is, is very, very useful. And also he talked a lot about um, monetary policy. So what, what I'm going to say in, my, in, in this presentation is basically drawing on personal experience and on two books that I wrote about the, uh, the Cyprus crisis and also you, the euro. Um, and and my my starting point is actually flows very nicely from um, uh, Martin's presentation, and and I, I I don't want to put Martin in that context, but I think it's just generally the economics profession. When the economics economists think of central banks, they just think of monetary policy, okay? And I think that that is important, of course. But that is not the only thing that central, bank do, central banks do. There are many other functions that central banks do. And in fact, what we've seen during the crisis is that those functions increase. So the scope of what central banks are doing increased. Of course, everyone knows that central banks do lender of last resort in crisis, uh, although central banks themselves initially had forgotten how to do that. <laughs> But they did that during the crisis. And of course, everyone knows that they issue and manage the currency. And that's not just, you know, sort of producing the notes, destroying them when they're, when they're finished, but it's also oversight over payment systems. And payment systems are kind of important during crisis. Now, more recent, um, well, sort of some, some central banks were had responsibility for microprudential supervision for a long time. Uh, some didn't and acquired it during the crisis, but also macroprudential regulation, which is a fairly new uh, sort of uh, responsibility. But on top of that, we also have bank resolution now, right? So when banks are failing or about to fail, more often than not, it is the national central bank that has to deal with it, right? And this sort of, this sort of thing comes, it becomes very important during crisis. Now, one thing that hardly anyone has thought of, right, and I am astonished, actually, given all this that is going on in the world, is anti-money laundering, right? A lot of central banks in the euro area have responsibilities over anti-money laundering. Now, what happens during crisis is you get some interactions between all these functions. And what happens during crisis is that, well, people remember that independence well, the independence of central banks, yes, it does apply to monetary policy very, very clearly, but it is not at all clear whether or the extent to which it applies to other functions. So, for example, anti-money laundering supervision is, is, is a very, very important function. And of course, it, in my view, it has to be covered by the same independent safeguards, but in practice it isn't. All right. So let me just show you a table. Go to the next slide, please. Oh, um, my goodness. So my next slide is Euro area central bank responsibilities. I'm not sure you have that. Um, yeah, it's the previous one, please. It's, it's slide number three. Three. Oh, there it is. Okay. So there it is. Okay. So that's just a snapshot of what we have at the minute. And you see a lot of central banks have banking supervision responsibilities. That's in the euro, um, um, in the euro area. And then a lot of them have bank resolution responsibilities. And again, a lot have AML responsibilities. And in Italy, they also have responsibilities over the financial intelligence unit. The financial intelligence unit is also part of the anti-money laundry sort of framework, but it's, it's the unit that investigates and sometimes has investigates sort of violations of the law and sometimes has um, uh, criminal sort of um, 
powers. So in, in Banca d'Italia, they also have that. Um, the interesting thing is that the central banks um, with just monetary policy responsibilities are the Bundesbank, of course, but also a few others. Um, Austria, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Malta. But they're a minority, only seven central banks. So can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So during the crisis, we have had mission creep, for, for sure. Monetary policy itself, the scope of it expanded. And I like the way that Martin explained that, that, you know, ECB was a bit late in that. Um, and and I, I agree with him that it was perhaps to do with the, 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 the political pressures. Um, so eventually did, the ECB did do whatever it takes. In fact, in some sense, arguably, it started doing whatever it takes under Trichet, but, all, but, but also rather secretly with the SMP. The SMP, the Sec uh, Securities Markets Program, started before Draghi, and it involved buying uh, bonds in secondary markets of stressed countries. So they were closing the yields, right, before Draghi, and before Draghi said they whatever it takes. And of course, in 2012, we have the, the, the famous phrase by, by Mario Draghi, whatever it takes, within our mandate, of course, to preserve the euro. And um, a lot of things happened. People associated that with OMT, but I, I think that's just too narrow. Uh, one of the things that um, the Euro system did was to provide liquidity support to banks, lender of last resort. And the Euro system did plenty of that. And you might think that um, that's just such sort of standard. But in the Euro in particular, it had pol strong political connotations. It was perceived as a mechanism of coercion by the ECB. And there were three countries in which that, was, that happened. One was Ireland, the other one was, was Cyprus, and the, the third one was Greece. So in all these three countries, at critical times, um, the politicians in these countries perceived the withdrawal of liquidity support as a mechanism of coercion to get them to agree to uh, conditionality and programs, right? So that kind of politicized the euro system. And then, of course, resolution powers. These were unprecedented powers that you could go in and impose losses on investors through bail-in, restructure banks, um, sort of uh, sell parts of banks to other banks, etc. So these are unprecedented powers. They're, they are important powers to have during crisis, but they don't come without, without consequences. Another, another um, um, function that the ECB did, which frankly it doesn't really seem to have much of a legal grounding, was that it became part of the Troika in program countries. Right? So had the Commission, the IMF, and the ECB being part of the Troika. Um, Post-crisis, uh, central banks acquired even more powers. Can we move a slide, please? Go. Okay, and even in the UK, we have changes. Banking supervision goes from the FSA to the Bank of England, and bank resolution is now within the Bank of England. Hardly anyone talks about it, but it is there, and it's very important that doing the resolution planning. Um, in Europe, we had the establishment of the single supervisory mechanism within the ECB to supervise all banks in the euro area, uh, particularly the systemic banks are about 120 banks are supervised directly. But interestingly, anti money laundering supervisions has remained the responsibility of national authorities. So they supervise everything other than anti money laundering. Um, and then we have these uh, uh, resolution responsibilities that about half of Euro system central banks have. So you've got about half of the NCBs in the Euro system having a lot of powers. Besides monetary policy, being involved in monetary policy, they also have supervision, resolution, and AML responsibilities. Um, and there's been hardly any attention as to how these expanded responsibilities interact, particularly during crisis. And I, I think this is where rebuilding macroeconomics can add value. You can encourage, you can do, pick call on this, or do some research on this. I think that would be important. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
Okay, so whatever it takes was great. It has preserved the euro, but it did have some unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences relate to that mission creep that I outlined. So there have been questions of legitimacy, there have been questions of accountability, there have been questions of transparency, and inevitably, it has made the euro system as a whole more political and more politicized. And that's why we now have question marks over independence. How do we move forward? Or should they be independent? I mean, it, the role of the ACB in the Troika came under a lot of criticism. Um, oh, please stay on the same slide. S slide six. Slide six, please. I haven't finished on slide six. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the, the other thing that happened during the crisis with whatever it takes, is just people started thinking that the ECBs and other central banks are the only game in town. And that has two consequences, political again. One is kind of creates more hazard for governments not to act, not to do the right thing, because the central banks would do it for us. But also, the, the flip side of that coin is that governments now have a convenient scapegoat when things go wrong. Oh, central banks didn't do enough. Some, some governments say they didn't do, the ECB didn't do enough. Italians may have said that. <laughs> Germans might say, oh, they did too much, right? And that's why we have all these problems. So, you know, by through all this, whatever it takes, I think central banks have become um, sort of more entangled in all these political um, controversies. And of course, markets themselves um, now <laughs> are testing Madame Lagarde's commitment because you have a change of leadership. Whatever it takes was sort of associated with Mario Draghi, although I would argue it wasn't just Mario Draghi. It was everyone in the ACB and the whole of the Euro system, basically. But Mario managed to get a lot of the credit for it, right? Others got just the toxic consequences from it. But Mario got the credit very nicely. Um, so they're now testing, inevitably, Madame Lagarde's commitment. And of course, um, I'm sure it's, it's there, um, whatever she has said or didn't say very well in the last uh, press conference. Um, okay. So I think that uh, I give examples in my books um, of erosion of national central bank independence as a result of this. Okay, can we move a slide, please? So collateral damage. So I don't need to say very much on independence, but one thing I, I should say here is that obviously the crisis tested the independence safeguards to its limits. And I, I, my conclusion is that those safeguards did not work well. If you take that in the Euro area has 19, 19 countries, right? Three central bank governors resigned before their term, and they are, besides me, Bostian Yazbek and Joseph Makush. People don't hear much about Joseph Makush. They heard about Bostian. But they were, all these three cases, I would argue, had to do with political pressures. Latvia was another case, um, and a very different one. Nevertheless, the governor was suspended for about one and a half year by um, decision of one judge. And I would argue that the commission did very little to uphold central bank independence. So it allowed it, basically, the independence of the central bank to be eroded. eroded. Can I move a slide, please? OK. So this is a commercial break. This is <laughs> advertising my first book. If you want to know more about how the independence of the central bank of Cyprus was eroded, it's all in there. And it's uh, told in, a, in the first 12 chapters as a sort of political and economic thriller. But the bottom line is, that number one, we provide a DLA, right? And it was a lifeline, right? And the politicians were very happy with that. But then afterwards, afterwards, they said, because they, the Troika used it in some sense as 
um, not a blackmail, I wouldn't describe it as blackmail, but that's how it was perceived. If you don't agree to this program, then the ECB will have to withdraw this liquidity. And of course, inevitably, what does it mean? You cannot reopen your banking system unless you reopen with another currency. So it was perceived by the local politicians in Cyprus that we gave the ECB the weapon of, of blackmail, right? And similar sentiments were in Ireland um, when they went into their first program, and in Greece, and I think Yanis Varoufakis said a lot about it. Um, now, that wasn't the only thing. We were the resolution authority. In fact, I didn't want to be the resolution authority because I could see what was coming. And, and of course, all it did was to implement the political agreement at Europe. But we became a convenient scapegoat because when we are imposing losses on shareholders, bondholders, and even uninsured depositors, you cannot imagine how it is like. I don't think anyone can imagine how it is like. People who lose money, whatever you call them, no matter how sensible they are in normal times, they go wild, they go crazy, and they use all the political levers they have to, uh, to do that. Um, so that's, that's, that's happened. And then, then another thing that happened, once we, we, we bailed in the big depositors, it turned out to be Russian peps, politically exposed persons, former members of the Duma, current members of the Duma, ministers, people connected to Mr. Putin. And moreover, some of them were connected to the Cypriot politicians. It's not a surprise how they got all that money into Cyprus. They, were, they, they had political backers right, to get the money in, and one of them was the president's law firm. Right? So as a result of all this, there was toxic political fallout. And it wasn't just they put pressure on me to resign. They changed the law. Right? They changed the law of the central bank, notwithstanding an ECB legal opinion, which said that if you do this, you're destroying not just the independence of the central bank, but its decision-making process. So um, basically, they gave powers to the board and re reduced the powers of the governor. And that's after that, a few months after that, I, I left, basically. Came back to the UK. I thought I had enough. So can you move a slide, please? Because you might say now, it's always oh, Cyprus who cares about Cyprus, right? It's just one small country in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, who cares? Well, I would argue you should. Because number one, C uh, central bank independence erosion is contagious. And in Slo Slovenia, what happened was pretty much similar to Cyprus. In, in fact, um, um, some people think that they, cop they, they copied what was happening in Cyprus. And, uh, and, and um, Bostian Jasbek eventually re resigned before the end of his term. And it had to do with bailing in bondholders in the two failing uh, banks. And then we have the Latvia example. Okay, can we move, please, to a slide? Just the worst time for them to be doing work outside, but I'm sorry about that. I hope you can't hear much of it. So was it just an issue of enforcement? I would argue no. It wasn't just the commission not doing enough. I think it's also a question of legal interpretation. Because if you start talking to lawyers, and I've talked to a lot of lawyers on this, um, you realize that the independent safeguards, at least when they're put into the treaty, had monetary policy in mind, right? So although it does mention other tasks, um, those other tasks are a little bit of a gray area. And the ECB chose to, on that, to go on its shell and, and say that actually our independence is to do with monetary policy, is not to do with all these other things. And then my question is, then why do we do resolution? Why do supervision, if that's the case, right? Um, so if governments are determined to undermine and control central banks, the national central banks I'm talking about, they can do so by capturing the boards and by attacking the central banks on all these other tasks, supervision and resolution. Can we go, please, another slide? And of course, you might say, OK, it's Cyprus, it's Slovenia, it's Latvia, maybe Slovakia, um, et cetera. Again, you know, maybe I'm not politically correct, even referring to these countries as periphery. 
but um, so be it. So does it matter? Um, well, I think it does matter. One reason is that others are watching and they may be changing their behavior. I think that, and that's my own personal interpretation, if you look at what happened two years ago um, with the banks failing in Italy and the banks failing in Spain, I was perplexed by the, the fact that the Banca d'Italia aligned itself completely with the Italian government during that period and was arguing for the protection of retail investors. That was, there's a BRRD, um, and the BRRD basically, the, the strict application of it meant they should have, they should have imposed losses on those, on, on those uh, so-called um, investors, but they didn't and they managed to avoid it. So I think that others may be changing their behavior. And of course, that's very hard to detect, but it could mean that next time we are in a, in a crisis, the Euro system central banks may do what governments want them to do rather than anything else. So it could be that the governing council eventually becomes a cacophony of national interests. And can we go down, please? I think more importantly, money laundering, right? And the anti-money laundering responsibilities. Because when dirty money enters um, the single market, it can travel freely. We've had a lot of money laundering scandals recently. And this is a, a, a page from the Danske scandal, just to show how interconnected the whole system is. So it's not just Estonia. The money comes in from where it comes in, uh, um, and, and, and it just sp is spread around. It can cause financial instability, it can cause uh, reputational damage, but it can also have political motives, right? Modern money laundering can have political motives, and in the United States, at least, they're very, very clear about what the political motives are, and they have to do with destabilizing Western democracies, right? So that, uh, whether you believe it or not, you have to accept that money laundering can destabilize countries. There are people who believe that even the Brexit, what happened in, in the UK, um, had to do with funding um, of the Brexit campaign, but also funding of the Tory party by um, Russian money. So whether you believe that or not, it's out there. The jury's out there. But I think that anti-money laundering implementation at the minute is at the level of the national member states. So any weaknesses you get in, in the smaller countries um, will matter. Okay, can we move please? One more slide. And this is the AML supervision of banks in the EU. And you can see that that's the EU now, not the, just the Euro area. Um, more often than not, it is the central banks that do it, right? So national central banks have this responsibility. Sometimes there are separate financial services, um, uh, financial contact authority, etc. And, and sometimes they coincide with the financial intelligence. Uh, so that's a snapshot of what goes on in the EU. Uh, go, next slide, please. Um, okay, so there have been proposals to strengthen uh, AML in Europe. And there's been a proposal by the European Commission and a proposal by six member states uh, to create a Europe. Both are kind of similar. They want to create a new body. I think it will take time to put that in place. Um, the European Commission wanted to give more powers to the EBA. The interesting thing is that they, they all now re recognize the limited resources and also the possibility of capture, but they nevertheless continue to rely on the national authorities. Um, there is an expectation that they will sort of intervene when the national supervisors are not doing the right job, but I'm not entirely sure how that, that can happen. And I think that, that those proposals address the symptoms, but they do not address the cause. And my proposals that are coming up next will address the causes of the erosion of central bank independence in the euro area. So they are broader, but they would also address AML, right? Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So what I'm suggesting is that First of all, hand over AML powers to the single supervisory mechanism. Some people say they already have them, but it's not very clear. So make it absolutely clear that they have them so they can intervene. I think they have adequate levels of independence and they do have strong governance, notwithstanding some question marks 
of the independence of members of the SSB who are not uh, the, the ECB members, but they nevertheless are better than what we had before. Um, so that will only cover the euro area, of course. So I think that's when the EBA can play a role. The EBA is smaller, but it can deal with the remaining countries. I, I don't think that um, you solve the problem of AML with just the strongest supervisor. I think Europe needs an agency with prosecution powers to prosecute offenders. And there are these money laundering crimes are can only be visible sometimes at the at the higher level, at the federal level, because of their nature. So money moving, dirty money moving through several jurisdictions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So at the national level, weaknesses can be addressed and should be addressed by strengthening the national central bank's independence, accountability, and governance. And um, what what hap is happening now, and I've I've seen it in several countries, not just in Cyprus, is that governments have the power to appoint to central bank boards uh, bankers who wouldn't qualify to be on commercial bank boards, according to freedom proper criteria. It is because freedom proper criteria for governance within the euro system are not uniform, which is quite um, astonishing, really. So we have freedom proper criteria for commercial banks, but we do not have freedom proper criteria for the central bank boards, right? And that's because governments basically quietly know that, and they don't, they don't, and are not keen to have them, they can basically appoint their people, their cronies often, right? I've seen a case where conflicted boards um, basically refuse to resource anti-money laundering property, right? So the governor can go in and say, we need 25 people. That's what the IMF is telling us. And the board saying, you must be crazy because you know, you're wasting public resources. And it is, you have to remember, the treaty protects the governors. It doesn't protect the boards. Uh, but the governors do not control the resources of the central banks. The governors themselves have to go to their boards. And it's their boards that decide the resourcing of the various functions. Right of the central banks, so they have an important role to play, and we need to address that at the European level. I think so. I'm suggesting to introduce EU-wide fit and proper criteria for uh, national central bank boards, and of course for the euro system as a whole. The same applies to executive board members of the ECB. Right, so everyone should be. This is this is good governance basically for the whole of the system. So that you don't see that, oh, there's that some sort of national central banks are being singled out. No, it's the whole of the euro system that, that should uh, do this. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, I have a few remarks on the current crisis. Um, and obviously, it's a very large both demand and supply shock. It's a big shock to the global economy. We'd like to think it's temporary. And uh, we'd like to think that once all these restrictive measures would be lifted, we will see a quick turnaround. And of course, this assumes that the governments and the banks take the right actions, the right actions, not just central banks. I think it's important to remember central banks work through the commercial banks, right? And central banks are doing all these relaxations. The ECB has put in this new form of QE, but the Fed and the Bank of England are also um, supporting liquidity in banks, we really need to see the banks themselves taking action. And I am very concerned that the banks themselves are not um, fully yet up to speed with that. I mean, the jury is still out, but what I've seen so far is I haven't seen enough. I mean, I've, I've been on various banks' websites which say coronavirus support. You do two clicks and then you are lost in their website. It's not... It doesn't seem to be enough. I think they should be doing a lot more to support households and firms because this is a much widespread, it's a very widespread crisis. Um, it's clear to me that central banks are doing whatever it takes within their legal constraints, but it is largely, again, it is a government action that we do need. Central banks should support them. I've seen arguments for the ECB to do hel helicopter money. Yeah, I would agree that with that, but. And I've heard Martin just a minute ago 
say that, oh, yes, they can do monetary financing. I just don't agree that the people on the governing council would sit there and, and they would agree to do monetary financing because they would all be in jail afterwards. I mean, that you, we have to accept that there are legal constraints. Unless you change the treaty, I don't think they will do it. They will find inventive ways to do it, right? Like they've done in the past, but they will not engage in direct monetary financing of governments. So we as economists are well advised to advise governments to change the treaty rather than to put pressure on our fellow economists who are um, on the, in those difficult sort of uh, policymaker positions to do more. Because that really is when, when people start worrying about their own personal sort of um, um, future. And I've, I've been there, and, and it is really tough. In a crisis, you need to act, but you still need to act within the law, right? We can't be expecting the governors and the members of the governing council to breach the treaty and provide direct monetary financing to governments. Indirect, yes, I'm sure they would be imaginative, and they are already very imaginative. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Great. Um, thank you, Panikas.